Hello, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. This is Jill. Have you ever wondered if you're just spinning in the wrong gear? And what is the right gear? That's what we'll talk about today. Life is like a 10-speed bicycle. Most of us have gears we never use. Charles Schultz. Today, we're going to be talking about the book, Five Gears, How to Be Present and Productive When There Is Never Enough Time, by Jeremy Kusabek and Steve Cockrum. This book had a lot of good reviews with it when it came to opening people's eyes to something they hadn't seen before. So I was pretty curious about what that thing was. A lot of times when you read books about productivity, you read a lot of the same things over and over again. And this felt a little bit new and fresh, so I was intrigued by what they were going to say. They say as an introduction, you're here, but you're really not here. You're with me, but you're somewhere far away. And he wonders how many people have actually said those words or something like them. It really does feel that people are somewhere else. They're not even there. We watch TV, maybe with friends. <clears throat> Nobody's watching the show. And if they're watching the show, they're just sort of glancing at it once in a while. They're stuck on their devices and phones. And I'm in that group, too. To be honest, I find a lot of TV really boring. And so if I didn't do something else, I would be just bored watching TV. And so the question is, where are we when we're with other people and with our friends and family? And how disconnected are we from other people because we're no longer having that experience? Sure, TV in the past was boring, too. But we were all there together. And I'm sure when my parents would watch with me the Sunday night Disney show, I'm sure they were bored out of their minds. I'm sure they saw half those shows a dozen times, but there was Jill ready to watch it again. You know what? My parents were there. They were with me. They were interacting, despite how bored they were. They weren't off reading a book or doing something else, and we didn't have phones. But I imagine today they probably would be on their phones. So what do we do to be on the other side of that? They asked some questions about, do you really know what it's like to be with you? Do you know what you seem like to other people? And I'm not just talking about this image that we have with other people and what they think of us. I'm talking about the loved ones in your lives. What do you think your kids think of you or your spouse or your significant other, your friends? You know, do they think you're there or do they think you're a million miles away all the time? It's disturbing, I think, if you really sat down and thought about what that impression is. They say that this goal in life in general is to get some peace and have peace around you, good relationships, feeling connected and with other people with those good relationships. But this is with an eye towards productivity. So it's not just talking about being with people. It's talking about what the right gear is when it comes to all the events in our lives. They say, too, that miscommunication, anger, all the stuff that we're seeing on the Internet is an outpouring of our busy lives, the fact that we're always tied up into something. And then when we do communicate, maybe it's not in the best way possible. And it's not so much that people are necessarily lazy. He says that lazy people just have basically given up on life, given up on self-improvement, personal growth. The rest of the people are just too busy. Both of them have the same output in it, but one is because they're busy and the other is because they're lazy. And they're just not even trying to engage anymore. So they want us to take a good look at how the relationships in our lives are going. Do we feel connected to people? Do they feel connected to us? Do we feel like those relationships are growing and strengthening? Or are they strained or just maybe not even there? The way you look at it is in terms of your priority. Maybe the fact that your priorities are somewhere else, then your relationships reflect what your priorities are. Talk about how you're not supposed to drive distracted because why you're not paying attention you're not you're going to miss something you're going to drive the wrong way you're going to go off the road when a big curve comes your way but we're driving distracted when it comes to our relationships and we're missing cues we're missing people and we're getting that same side effect as you would if you were driving distracted if we're driving relationships in a distractive way so they're going to break this down into different gears And we're going to talk about the right gears for the right time. And that's what they're really talking about when it comes to how to be engaged, when to be engaged, when to be productive. It's not just a connection book. It's a productivity book that looks at the holistic aspects of our lives. And he says that once we learn all the gears and we learn what they're for, we'll learn the right way to drive. 
the right speed, the right situations. And that's the right thing to do. It's not just saying, okay, I'm going to be reconnected all the time, or I'm going to be productivity and getting my things done all the time. The idea is that we're going to be in the right place at the right time. So the first one he talks about is fifth gear. And fifth gear is when we're in that zone. We always talk about it, the flow, right? You're working so hard on something and all of a sudden you look at the clock and it's six hours later and suddenly you realize you just lost half the day by working on this project. And it's great because you're actually getting a lot of things done. You're really productive in that time. And it's when you have a lot of creativity in the work that you're doing because it's a focus mode and maybe even a hyper focus mode, productivity is fantastic at that time. It says that if you were to watch you be in fifth gear, it might appear that you are unaware of what's going on around you. You may not hear things that are going on. You may be completely trans-like. You might not even feel like you're present in the room. And it's great to be in that mode again because you're getting so much done and you're probably doing a great job on whatever project you're working on. They said, quote, a healthy fifth gear makes it possible to cruise at a sustained speed for a period of time. And it happens because we're passionate. Maybe we're competent at our jobs. We're doing quite well, and we're really focused in on what we're doing. We need less energy because we're at that gear. We're able to put less input in and get this high level of output. So we really rely on fifth gear. In fact, I think a lot of us wish that we were in that fifth gear more where we're able to just focus on what it is we're trying to do and just accomplish it. They say that some of us are good at it, some of us are bad at it. Sometimes we get into that focus mode once a year. Some people are good at it and they get in that focus mode every day. There are problems with fifth gear. You're not there. You're not present at all. You're not engaging with the people around you. And they say that the best thing that you can do is to set expectations. Just let everyone know, hey, I'm going to put my headphones in. We're going to focus for a little bit. I need to knock this out and I need to be in that focus mode at this moment. That's really a good idea. When I worked in the office, we used to have this thing about headphones in general. We were a very collaborative company. And so while headphones were okay, it just seemed like you were shutting out the rest of the world and it could be off-putting to someone who came to your desk and tried to engage you and try to seek out some of your expertise. We would often announce, hey, I'm going to put on my headphones for a while. I'm going to focus for a while. You know, I'll, I'll take them off after lunch so that people had that expectation that you're really trying to get something done and you have a huge deadline to do that. It also says that sometimes being off site is helpful, too. Maybe you won't be disturbed by other people around you and you'll be able to focus. I think that was a lot of my problem at work in general is that I have a huge ADD problem. And when people are talking and moving around me, I can get driven away from my work easily. I can look at that person and see this thing and look at that car over there and, oh, there's a bird in the sky. And it was hard for me to focus. And so when I did put my headphones on and tried to focus, it became better for me, but I think it became worse for everyone else. And so now that I work from home, my productivity is much better than it ever was. I'm more lonely. I don't see anyone anymore. But for work purposes, I'm getting it done. But it also means that I'm not interacting with anyone and I'm also not helping those around me that I used to help. It says too, like if you're going to do it when you're at home or around people that you love, to let them know that you're trying to focus on something and let them know what time it will be over with so that you'll play with them, your kids later in the night, you'll watch TV with your significant other or your friends at night, and you promise you'll be there with them during that time. If you do too much of this fifth gear, you can feel very disconnected. You can miss out on everything that's going around you with your family, and you can feel burned out. If you're in that mode all the time, it can get very easy to get very tired quickly. The next gear is fourth geared, and that is a task-specific world. And that's really, I think, where a lot of us sit, particularly those of us who are into productivity he says that we spend 85% of our time in fourth gear. It is a task-driven world. It is a task-driven office. We have task sheets and to-do lists and productivity tools, and we're doing those things on the list. We may not necessarily be in focus mode at that time, but we are driving it. 
you know, and we're getting our things all checked off. I have friends who love to put things on task lists just so they can check them off. And we are getting it done. But the problem with it is, is that it takes more energy for us to do these task lists constantly. It is time consuming and it could eat up your whole life. You could just spend your whole life in task mode, knocking one thing out of another and never really get back to being in relationships with other people. They say that a warning sign that you've been in fourth gear too much is that you're constantly starting your day with email. Woohoo, that is me. You know what the first thing I do when I get up? I look at my email. I look at my schedule. I look to see what news I missed during the day. I am just catching up to see what it was that I need to start doing and what happened before I was going. They also said that you will be obsessed with tasks, that your achievements in life will become your chief goal of your life, that you have no boundaries. You just never stop. You're always doing tasks. It was funny. When I remember my grandmother, she was someone who always had tasks. She was busy, 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 and she was always doing something. And sometimes we'd be watching TV together and suddenly she'd get up and do the dishes and we're like, hey, we're watching TV together or we're looking at this book together. What are you doing? Oh, well, I just remembered I had dishes in the sink. She just couldn't get out of that. And boy, that's me now. I am into my tasks. I get things done all the time. Yesterday, my friends were busy. And what did I do? I knocked out three podcasts. I wrote two more. I got them published and ready to go. The second podcast is up and running, and that will come out on Tuesday. I was knocking things off my list. I went into my recording room, and I organized it. I got rid of a bunch of stuff, but I also didn't stop. I realized suddenly it was 930, and I hadn't done anything fun. I hadn't relaxed. I hadn't enjoyed the day at all. Nice that I got it all done, but, you know, I could have also maybe focused on some other things, too. It can cause some anxiety if we've been separated from our work. And you know, those people are like, oh, I just have to check my work email. Oh, I have to just check this. I need to look at this. Oh, I knew someone was going to contact me. And the problem with it is that you're always in this state of drain and you're never fully charged. It's hard to get out of that gear. And sometimes it is hard to sleep because you're just sitting there and thinking about all the things you need to do. And you know what I do? I wake up at three o'clock in the morning and I think, oh, you know what would be great? is if I move this piece of furniture to that other side of that room, and then maybe if I tried writing this podcast tomorrow, and then, oh, I should do this at work, and I start what I call list making. And once I start list making in the middle of the night, I don't go back to sleep, and I never get back to sleep. This is a huge problem. And so when I read this book, I'm like, oh my gosh, fourth gear is my life. What happened to me? How did I get stuck in fourth gear? It says a lot of times, too, people will feel like, the family comes second. They will notice that you are always getting things done and that you're never really there with them emotionally, intellectually, you're not engaging with them. So they say that one of the things you can do to get better about this is to, first of all, stop looking at emails the first thing in the morning and try to do something more inspirational. You know, maybe this is where it's a time for you to do some prayer. Maybe this is a time for you to go for a walk or exercise, but stop being that morning person who immediately kicks in, try to do some other things. This is probably where that startup routine in the morning will help you not quite get dragged into work that first instant that you're awake. Also says that you should be proactive, which means you plan your day. You're just not reactive all the time. You're just not putting out every forest fire that comes your way. You're planning your day and you're planning when your off times are too. Sometimes you bring the phone behind. Sometimes you create focus modes if you're an Apple user so that you don't even see your work apps when you're after work time. He says that you can teach your family what the signs of you being in task mode are. And then they can help you remind you, hey, I thought we were going to go watch the game today and now you're just stuck on your phone. Kids are a great way of reminding us when we've gone too far. Third gear, he says, is the fact that social matters. Talks about getting out and doing things with friends, going to the coffee shop, going out to dinner, going to the movies, visiting your friends, playing board games, spending time with your coworkers or other relationships that you have, and to connect with other people. That's third gear. This is what I thought was really interesting. It says, we think that social interaction is important, 
But how many times do we set up a future time for our next event? Last time I talked to my vice president, we went out to lunch. We had a great time. And she said, you know what? We should do this every month. And I said, yeah, absolutely. And that was four, five months ago. What happened? I don't know. The summer got away from me. So now I'm realizing that the problem is, is that we really need to schedule our next event while we're sitting there so we don't put it off. Even my coworker reached out to me on Friday and set up a lunch for us to go out on Thursday. It's kind of interesting working from home because now when I do have contact with my coworkers, it's intentional, but that means we also have to actually do it. Actually setting up a time is the important key. And he says that if we avoid, you know, social interaction, we can look like we're stuck up. We can look like we're not approachable. I think that maybe at work, you know, sometimes if I just went to work first thing in the morning, slammed my headphones on and started off my job, people didn't feel comfortable coming up to me and saying, hey, Jill, could you help me with this? And you know what? I'm that person. I love helping people with things. But my fourth gearishness caused it so that people wouldn't come up to me at all. And so that was very enlightening to me that I thought I was just focusing and doing the job that my company was paying me to do. But instead, I was putting people off probably. He says, too, that we can get trapped in third gear, which means that we're always about people and that we're always putting people first, which is good. We love people. We love helping people, but that we may start to procrastinate. We might not actually get anything done, that we may be talking to people all the time that we look like we lack discipline or we're not very professional, and that all our relationships are very superficial. You know, I think it's a problem, but I think that I've seen people like that at work, especially you work in a tech company, right? That's the whole idea. You're going to have game rooms and this room and engaging cafeteria, lunch rooms, and you see that there are some people on your team, they're always in those rooms. They're always talking. They're always chatting. And you're getting slammed with work and you're thinking, gosh, if that other person would just do their job, I wouldn't be stuck at my desk all the time. So then it's a problem if you're not really getting out and getting things done. Then second gear is getting deep connections with people, having that deep relationship, spending time with your kids, with your coworkers, and really understanding people and having that deep relationship with them. You're playing with your kids, you're spending time with your spouse, you're going on date nights, and instead of just checking in with people at work, you're actually spending good, solid, quality time with them. He mentioned something about like having a fire pit in your backyard where you invite everyone. You know what? I have a fire pit in my backyard. I have a nice big backyard, and my friends love coming over and having fire pit night. But do we remember to schedule a time where we can have fire pit night? We just always forget that. He says that it's important that when we're in that second gear, that we actually listen. We're not forcing it. We're not being inauthentic about being there. You know, you've seen people like that who are, and I probably do it a million times, where you're at a restaurant with someone who is very distracted all the time. And they're basically forcing their face to face the other person so that they can concentrate on them. But you can tell it's not a genuine, I'm really interested in you. It's a, I am forcing myself to be present in this moment. And if it happens more, we'll get more inspired. We'll we'll trust each other more. We'll like each other more. There'll be less drama and less misunderstanding. So it's really important to get into that mode. But he also mentions that America loves to be in second gear, which means that we're all about having fun and not about deep relationships or not about productivity, that we're just there to sort of be in this hazy social interaction all the time. And now comes first gear, which is where we actually rest, recharge, we spend time enjoying people around us, we're getting enough sleep, we're spending time reading and exercising, we're doing our devotions, our prayer time, We're getting meditation in and time to just pursue hobbies. And some of these activities will depend whether or not we're an introvert or an extrovert. An extrovert would love to get with other people and do crafts together and and share ideas and bounce them off other people. 
While an introvert might enjoy just getting some quiet prayer time, a good walk in, or working on their hobbies. Says that it's hard for us to rest all the time. You know, maybe we're working 60, 80. I had a job that was over 100 hours a week. And we think we're resting on the weekends. But what they say we're doing is we're crashing. We're just collapsing on the weekends, napping and falling asleep. And then we throw ourselves into maybe a video game where we're just completely outside our realm. And they say that is not that true rest. And that is not gear one. That is you just recovering from just being completely trashed by your work and by your efforts. You must start scheduling it ahead of time so that you can get them in. And if we get stuck in first gear, they say that you're just escaped from reality. You have too much time devoted to first gear. You're over-focused on gaming, exercising, maybe all those things. We tend to think of one thing is better than the other. But if we're overly focused on it, it's still bad, whatever it is that we're doing. You know, maybe you're demanding the family respects your recharge time, you know, so that you're not playing with your kids, you're not out with your spouse because you're resting. And I'm not saying that it's not good to rest when you have a family, but it also can't dominate the entire family and everything that they're doing too. In this gear, they talk, like we talked about all the different gears, that if you're finding that you're out of whack with this, either you're not getting enough of it or you're getting too much of it, it's time to put in boundaries. It's time to invite others to do things with us and scheduling it so that we make sure that we're getting enough of all the different gears at that right moment. In the end, if we've been in the wrong gear at the wrong time and breaking our relationships or not being present in our relationships, the best thing that we can do is apologize. Start being responsive and start being in the right gear at the right time. It says it takes self-awareness. It takes you to stop being in a victim mentality. Oh, my family will never let me rest because they always want so much from me. It probably has a lot to do with how you're going into that relationship, how you're talking to them. Maybe you're either being so task-oriented, you completely ignore them, or you're being so rest-oriented, you're completely ignoring them. And it's not their fault probably has to do with a lot of the ways that you're bringing yourself into those relationships, not communicating, not scheduling, and not having boundaries. He says that people have different orders. One of the co-authors gives an example. He starts out in fourth gear, task management, goes to gear one, gets a little rest in, slides into task three, which is get some social interaction, later gets into that focus mode, and then starts working on that social relationship later, towards night. You can kind of see how that day would go. You'll have to figure out what exactly it is that you do in your schedule. And he gives some examples at the end of the book about what their shift looks like. So they write down just a loose chart. You know, from this time to this time, I'm in fourth gear, sometimes fifth gear. From this time to this time, I drive home and I'm usually in fourth gear or maybe first gear. You know, and at dinner time. I'm in second gear. So you can see that how he's going through this. They create this map or the schedule of what their day looks like in the different gears. And if you find that you're lacking gears at a certain time, maybe it's time to take a look and see if you can adjust your schedule and see where you're going wrong with some of your gears. Because it's one thing to write down your schedule and where your gears are at, but it's another thing to realize that you're never fixing anything. Obviously, the first step is to know what's going on, but the second step is to start working to make it better. Then once you feel like you have a decent gear schedule, something that you want to aspire to, obviously, we're not going to get there all in the same day. Share it with other people. Let them know that, you know, your time during this time and that time is focus mode. So for me, I tend to be an afternoon person. I'm not much of a morning person. So I get very task oriented in the morning because it's easy for me to check things off of a list because it does not require the same brain power as focus mode. By the time 10 o'clock rolls around, I get into that focus mode. So I could share with my workers that from 10 until lunchtime, I'm going to put my headphones in. I'm going to try to drill down and focus so I can get a lot of things done. But in the afternoon, I'll have more time to collaborate and work with other people. Says that you're going to start practicing. You're going to try this out. Obviously, like I said, we're not going to fix this in a day. 
You got to tinker with your schedule a little bit and get to a good place where it all works out. Says it's good if you could get to first gear at the start of your day because you'd be recharged. And a lot of that, you know, it's probably sleeping because you recharge when you sleep. But maybe you can also do something like exercise or do something fun that gets your day off to a great start. On your drive home, if you have a drive home, try to make that a transition time that will get you out of fourth or fifth gear so that you can now shift into a more social, relaxing period. Even lunch times can be a good transition time too. So in the end, I really liked this book. I liked this aspect of it because sometimes you'll read books and it's all like, you should connect with your family. And then other books are like, you should be more productive. And I liked how this book tried to bring it all together. But there's a time and a place for each different type of motion, activity, focus. And if you get them in the right spot, your work will be great. Your relationships will be even better. And you'll feel great because you'll be connected to people because you're going to be at the right gear at the right time. So my challenge to you is to write up a worksheet with your time schedule. What gear do you start off with when you get up in the morning? And where are you sort of mid-morning? At lunchtime, do you go to a different gear? And what do you do in the evening? And take a look at your chart and see where there are places for improvement. All right, everyone, thanks so much again. I really am thankful for you being out there and listening to this podcast. It really means a lot to me, and I want to thank you genuinely. Please remember that you can always contact me at jill at smallstepspod.com. And I got a new podcast, Small Steps with God, which you can find at smallstepswithgod.com. Email me and I will always answer your questions, take on topics that you're interested in doing, or just pray for you. And remember that you can get in the right gear by taking small steps.